Making sure. <laughs> There's always that one person. Oh, well, hey, it is so good to see you all this morning. My name is Jacob Morgan. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Calvary. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It's a uh, not very bright day, but that's okay. Sometimes the rain is nice, especially after how hot it's been, right? Exactly. So, hey, we have a few quick announcements uh, for you guys this morning. The first one, I am actually going to turn over to my friend, Laura Mintz, who's going to come and tell you a little bit about our Mops Garage sale this weekend. Good morning, Calvary. Hello. So, like Jacob said, it's been very hot. Yesterday was very hot. So we had our Mops Garage sale yesterday, one-day sale outside. And we had a goal of $2,000 to meet our budget to be able to have Mops be completely financially um, independent from Calvary. So we don't have to take anything from um, the church's budget. So our goal was $2,000. Um, at noon, you know, it was so hot. At noon, Mary and I went and counted, and we were at $2,736. We were so overwhelmed, I'm probably going to cry, we were so overwhelmed by the amount of you that came and helped us. I went out at, with two teens at, what, 6.30, <laughs> and started them unloading furniture from the trailer. Thank you, Deacons, for that ramp. It was wonderful. Um, and I came out 10 minutes later. I sent Kyle Denny out there, and I came out 10 minutes later, and most of the furniture was already off the truck, and that just brought me to tears. So um, God is good, right? <laughs> um, and then, so we did our final count, I don't know, about 7 o'clock last night, um, and we were at $4,100. <laughs> So, with that being said, we have covered our budget for this year, and we already have half of our budget for next year. So, thank you so much, Calvary. They followed you up. They snuck behind you. They're sneaky like that. <laughs> so, it seems like sometimes when it seems like we're surrounded by so much bad news, it is great to hear good news, and not just good news, but good news of how God is moving. So praise him for all of that. Hey, we have a few more things to tell you all, and then I'm going to step off the stage. But the exciting thing that we're doing to get the gospel out into our community is something called Saturate Bradley, where we've been taking gospel material out to all of the houses in the Bradley Township. And so though we do that on Saturdays at 9 o'clock. So the next one is coming up this coming Saturday. I want to encourage you, if you are able, can join us at 9 o'clock. Come join us. Come walk around. Help distribute those materials. Um, get the hands in the gospel of everybody in Bradley. As well, we're excited for the church picnic coming up Sunday, August 9th. So mark that on your calendar. Uh, we've got information for that in the bulletin. We're going to be at the Kankakee Sportsman's Club, so we're looking forward to that opportunity. Um, as well, you all know the Tharnish family that have been a part of the Calvary family for a very long time, recently left for life action. Uh, they're going to be back in town Sunday, July 26th, here at the church from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and inviting everyone for a little ice cream social to talk a little bit about their ministry. So I want to make you aware of that, send out that invitation to everybody as well. And then if you need to know any more information about these things, also about um, awesome prayer opportunity that we have on Wednesday mornings, all that information is in your bulletin. We want to point you to that to check that out. You can also check out this information and more on the church website, calvarybible.church. And there's a little button on there that says Calvary News, and it's got tons of news of things going on here at the church. So that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, we do want to lift up our missionaries this morning. Um, we have every month we do a missionary of the month that we take time, that we pray for, that we put focus on just to make everyone... <clears throat> it's not what you think. Um, but just to make everybody aware of the missionaries that we support here at Calvary. And so this month is Roger and Nancy Bowers. Again, in that bulletin, there is a little insert that we have that has lots of information about them and their ministry. And we want to lift them up this morning as they are working with the Basque people of France, um, people that there's not a whole lot of evangelical Christians among them. And so we want to lift them up and pray for them and their efforts. So church family, would you, uh, oh wait, before, before I do that, I almost forgot, but I remembered, there is a video that we have to show you from the Bowers of their time working with the Boss people. So before we pray for them, let's check out this video.
about 3 million people and only about 300 known believers. Please pray for us as we begin our life here in this spiritually dark region. Pray for us to find relationships with the ones whom God has called to receive the gospel. Pray for the hearts, their hearts to be open and willing to receive the hope of salvation that Jesus is offering. So we'll be doing ministry in a town called saint Palais, which is in the center of the French Basque country. And we've already made connections with some of the pastors along the coast, which is about an hour and a half from here. And they are praying for us too. Pray for us to make connections with key people in the community, the mayor, the um, shopkeepers, teachers, etc. Also, our visas are up for renewal, so please pray for this to be a smooth process. Because of the virus lockdown, as you can imagine, Things in the government are backed up and slowed down here too. We are so grateful for your partnership with us here on the mission field. Without you, we wouldn't be able to continue the work that we do. So thank you. We would love to hear from you. We've been praying for you during this troubling time and we'd like to know how you're doing and how we could pray for you better. We look forward to what God is doing and what he's going to do in the Basque region. And don't forget to check out our next newsletter. It'll have our new address in it. And thanks. May God bless you all. Au revoir. Calvary, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for another morning that you give us to be a part of your creation and in being a part of your creation to do your kingdom work. God, I pray that you uh, would work through us, your people. God, that you would speak to us this morning as, uh, as we prepare our hearts to listen to you, to listen to your word, and to listen to your spirit. God, we do want to lift up the Bowers um, and the, such an awesome mission that they have amongst a people group that has very little believers. Lord, would you bless them richly would you use them in mighty ways uh, and just use them for your purposes of sharing the gospel with the Basque people. God, be with us this morning. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Why don't you stand and greet one another as we begin worship. There's so many things right now to be thankful for, even though it's kind of gloomy out right now. I mean, there's just so much with uh, the garage sale being so successful yesterday to the missionaries, video, everything. So uh, let's just pray now and uh, prime our hearts for worship that God shows us his glory.
some tech issues this morning, but how about Alan and all them back there working so hard? <laughs> First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Sing out, worthy is the Lamb.
So if you are uh, ages fifth grade and under, come on up. We've got a little presentation for you. Do not be shy. It'll be a good one. world's smallest communion service up here. Thought I'd make it look like the deacons and the elders here do. So, actually, um, food, yeah. Some, lots of smiles up here now. Um, this is a pound cake. The cool thing about a pound cake is you get lots of pounds when you eat it, okay? But um, they must have made it with, with weights and measures, with pounds of stuff before. But uh, I use cups and measuring things in the kitchen. But uh, the really cool thing about a pound cake is there's just a few ingredients in it. There's sugar and flour and eggs and butter, and that's it. Four simple ingredients, you get to put them together. I know, I had you guys on sugar, right? You're, you're all with it? Okay. So, here's some pound cakes I made in addition. This one I made without any flour. I, I, I have four containers up here, and I took one of the ingredients out for every one I made. So... This one has no flour, just the butter, the sugar, and the eggs. Um, there's, a, there's a little texture to it. It doesn't taste any, any good. I'll, I'll share with you guys a little bit here in a minute. Now this one, this one I made uh, without any sugar. So, no fun. The smiles are gone. All right. Okay, uh, this one was the lump that I put in the, in the bowl in the oven, it, it didn't change. It didn't like settle down and start bubbling and all that stuff. It was, it's all messed up. This one had no butter. This one uh, was very dry. I, I tried to cut these open to try to get pieces to show you, but... Uh, that one looks as dry as a rock. That's kind of like the rocks that we've been bringing a few weeks, right? To teach lessons with. That's, that's like a rock. This one here has no egg. Um, still got the sugar, though, okay? It still has some sweetness to it and all that. But uh, honestly, to, to, uh, this, this, this is the real pound cake, okay? I, I cut it, so I got little pieces I can, I can share. But uh, the other ones, I, had to, I was afraid I was going to break the bowl. I was trying to put that knife in there, trying to cut these open, and, and it was semi-successful. But uh, four simple ingredients. If I leave out just one, it doesn't turn out right. Now, Jacob, which one of these five would you think you would be interested in? The real pound cake with all the ingredients? Yeah. Yeah. You are as smart as you look. Um, you see, the, the, the same Jesus that said where the, when there was nothing, there wasn't any material. There wasn't any space or time. Or there wasn't anything. And Jesus said, let there be light. And the word of his power, just his word, the spoken word, caused light to exist. Light could not help but exist because Jesus God himself had spoken it, okay? He is the same Jesus who in John chapter 3 
talk to a man named Nicodemus, talk to him about how he could see God. And he says, farther on, and you know the verse, I'm going to say a few words of this verse that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. I'm going to stop, and you tell me what the next word is, okay? For God so loved the the world, yes. Now, was he talking about God so loved the trees? No. What, what does he mean by world? All of the people, exactly. Okay. God loves everybody, every life. Just like all these ingredients I had up here, I'd leave one out. It's all messed up. Okay. I, I, God loves every one of us here on earth. Every human life. God loves, deeply loves, sent Jesus to die for us, rose again from the dead, told us it is finished. Our salvation is there. God loved every one of us, any color, any country that we're from, no matter how short we are. And I now wore my unborn lives matter shirt, okay? Even folks who can't speak for themselves, God loves them too. Well, God loves every one of us. All right. Now, there is flour, sugar, eggs, and that's all there is in this. So if you guys are allergic to something and you can't eat one, don't take a piece, but I got a little piece for you, okay?
singing songs to you and glorifying you. We're just so thankful for the freedom to be able to do this, Lord, in the midst of a world that just desperately needs you, Lord. We are just glad to be in your presence, Lord, and constantly seeking ways to further your kingdom. Be with us now. Be with the message. Be with our hearts as we go from this place. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's do a test on... Okay, good. Thank you. Didn't get a chance to do that before. Uh, thank you to whoever uh, tossed out a cup here for me. Uh, honorary Texan. So, not yet. So, not, not yet. Okay. okay. Let's do that recheck. There we go. Thank you. All right. I th- thought I would uh, open us up with uh, a little bit of prayer and uh, people in our midst that we, uh, we know and that we care for. And I just thought I'd pray for a couple minutes, if you don't mind. So let me, let me bow, and let's bow in prayer. Lord, I ask that uh, you, as a God that knows all, is everywhere, and can do anything, that we come to you as complete and just the opposite. We are finite. We're men and women with feet of clay. We are inconsistent. We, uh, we ail and we pass, we age, and uh, we trip, we fall, we laugh, we cry, and uh, Scripture calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, and we've had opportunity to rejoice with the MOPS ministry. We're thankful for all the people that labored to make that event happen, and thank you for the resources that they've arrived and achieved and met. Uh, had given, and I pray that this ministry would see women come to know you and strengthen their capacity to be good moms who love you, Jesus, as they love their kids. So, But we also want to lift up and ask that you would uh, wrap your arms around some people as well, and because uh, they're either they're in a state of grief or they're hurting. I think of uh, Monty Rasmussen, one of our missionaries who passed away on July 9th. He and his wife were married 64 years. Thank you for that. Be with that family as they walk through this journey of loss and grief. I think of John Johnston, whose brother Joe, very close. They were very close. He suddenly passed away just this past week. Be with him as he walks through that state of grief as well. It's the second time this year that's happened and with another one of his siblings earlier. Lord, we pray for Herb Peterson, who just out of nowhere went from playing volleyball to now just in such pain. And he's on the cusp of having hospice care. 
I pray that you'd be with him. That we would pray for her. For Betty, Betty Smith began driving and getting around, and lo and behold, she stumbles and falls, and she's now in recovery again for a hip injury. And I asked, do you, she's been there now, but I pray that you'd continue to be with her recovery. And thank you for her smile and her conversations that I've had with her, for that family. For Marlene Hansen, Lord, who, as I understand it, as she is making progress on that left side, I ask that you'd continue to strengthen her, Lord. Thank you for Ron and that family. Be with Lindsay Garcia as she continues to recover. Brenda Williams and Elizabeth Ruprecht, who, as I understand, might have an appointment or hoping to up in Mayo at some point. I just, uh, we could go on and on. Thank you for opportunities for us to pray together as we have set forth as well. May we avail ourselves of those opportunities. And now, as we look into the book of Acts, which is what we've been doing for a little while, Lord, I pray that we're learning and growing. We're understanding what it is to, to not only be a church, but spread the glory of the church in our area and over land and sea. Thanks for this time, for the diligence of the people in your name. You have your Bibles, turn with me, if you will, to uh, the book of Acts. We're in chapter 16 uh, this week. The uh, superintendent, Rick Thompson, was here last week. Um, I was thankful for his willingness to fill the pulpit and share with you. Uh, but Acts 16 is where we're at. This is a, there, there's, a phrase that, there's a phrase that says something to this effect, and you have perhaps heard it. Those who do not learn from the past are prone to repeat it. Those who do not learn from the past uh, are prone to repeat it. The inference, of course, is that we must learn from the mistakes, from the mistakes in the past, lest we mess up again. But but the reverse is also true. Prone to repeat can be a good thing. Prone to repeat can be a good thing if we learn and apply positive or constructive lessons along the way. And that's, that's where I'm hoping for us to be taken this morning as we walk through the chapter, Acts chapter 16. We're striving to uncover what it is to be a, be a church, which is universal. It's not a building. It's people. Men and women and children and teenagers who come to a point where they realize they're broken, they're lost, there's a separation, there's a chasm between a holy, holy God and themselves, and they, they realize they're sinners, and they, they seek by God's call to ask Him to come into their life. That's the church. That's the church. We're walking through this particular book, which is the church's history textbook, if you will, of our Bible and provides us with insights, and we want to know what those are. And uh, so we're dealing with inside chapter 16, we're in the midst of what is the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. An overview, I'll break it down into four sections. The overview of the chapter, large overview, uh, the blimp view, if you will. Number one is the addition of Timothy to the team, verses one through five. A young man named Timothy comes along and is invited by Paul to be a participant in this missionary uh, journey, this missional moment. The second thing we will see is a divine directive by the Spirit heading west, if you will, young man. I take that from Michael W. Smith's song years ago, Head West, Young Man, 6 through 10. The conversion, another pretty significant conversion because it plays out uh, in the fact that this woman supported Paul's ministry. Uh, a conversion of a woman in verses 11 through 15. Her name is Lydia. And then the incarceration, the fourth big view, and then the conversion of a prison guard, verses 16 and following. The stadium, if we're 
coming down from the blimp or coming down into the stadium, we want to need some, there's some information that we're trying to gather and some important facts. And the question I want to ask is, as we come, as you and I come to, as we come to know Christ, and we, when we know Christ, we cannot help, here, this is my conviction, to know him, not just about him, but to know him, I believe will compel us, compel you and I, to make him known. It will compel us to make him known. As we come to know him and make him known, what are some teachable nuggets that we can grab from this specific chapter today? If our aim, if our aim is to have a ripple beyond the confines of uh, the region of Kankakee, including Kankakee, but beyond, what would we do well to learn from the history recorded here from so many years ago? I have four things, and then some application points, what we call the field view. First one is, we will, number one, we will build into the next generation, We will build into the next generation, verses 1 through 5. Paul is, figuratively speaking, he is a senior pastor, if you will, a lead pastor, who becomes aware of a younger, thirsty, teachable man named Timothy that he wishes to mentor, or what we will call, because we are into this, we're seeking to build a culture of this, a disciple, a disciple. A disciple was there, verses 1 and 2, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers of Lystra and Iconium, and Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. I want you to come with me. Let's do life together. Let me build into you. When, When Jill and I When Jill and I were praying about where the Lord might send us uh, upon finishing up grad school at Trinity, uh, the seminary, we received counsel along the way. And one piece of advice that I got was, uh, was coming out fresh out of school that it might be, it could be, the perfect time to think about initially in the ministry stepping into an associate role as an assistant pastor, an associate pastor, uh, so that I might work under uh, and sit and learn from someone who's been there and tasted it uh, and learn from uh, from that experience. And that's what I did. In fact, I did it for my first two ministries. And one was short and painful, and the second was glorious and fun. But they were both necessary to shape and develop me into who I have uh, become. Um, I learned a lot. I watched. I listened. I asked questions. I uh, brainstormed. I grew. Um, As a lead pastor in the ministries since that time, I have relished time to, to, uh, to reflect and be queried and challenged and sharpened and be sharpened by those we would call associate staff, office staff, associate staff. I, 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 having a strong, having a strong rapport with each one of the staff and having a staff that just uh, works well together is a rich experience. I like that. I love that. Uh, And when it's not available, it's extremely painful. Um, here in our passage, Paul saw potential in a young man, an associate, if you will, and enlisted him for the spread of the gospel, and Timothy responded so well. Um, do not miss this critical point here. Build into the next generation. Number one, godly parenting set the tone for Timothy's life. Godly parenting set the tone for Timothy's life, how he was raised. Uh, You see in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Eunice, the mom, and Lois, the grandma, were seen as extremely important in the raising of Timothy. 
He may not have gotten a whole lot out of dad. Uh, We're not sure. But Eunice and Lois are commended. Godly parenting set the tone for the development of Timothy in his initial stages of coming to know Jesus and being shaped. Number two, godly parenting ideally ideally is a team concept uh, with both mom and dad, but not always, right? Uh, it, it doesn't always happen that way. But it, it, ideally, it is a team concept. Mom and dad work together. And believe me, the kids, guys, the kids, your kids, they know, they know who's going to spur them on, challenge them, we, and, and work with them in, in, in knowing spiritual things. And they'll either, they'll, either, they'll either lean in that direction or they'll side with the other half that blows off spiritual stuff, Christianity and the faith. Number three, godly parenting, godly parenting doesn't need to be reserved for only those who are literally and relationally parents. I mean, you get to a point in time where either you never were able to have children, and we had had two couples on the East Coast when we were out there for 16 years who were not able to have children, and they were, they were parental to our kids, Miss Sally, Mr. Tom, and Charlie and Jeannie, they invested time and energies into our kids to the, to the benefit. You don't have to literally be a parent in order to come alongside and encourage a young person in their development and their awareness of who Christ is. Build into the next generation. Number four, and as anyone who has more than one child will attest, you don't or you ought not to cookie cutter your parenting. Paul's handling of Silas with circumcision was different from Timothy, as an example. Our kids, we have four children, four kids. They're all adults now, what I'm calling children. Four kids. And to be honest with you, we're concerned about all of them. But our heart really right now breaks for two of them. Build into the next generation. Here's the, here's the life application to the field view application. If you love Jesus and the Word of God, the Bible, find someone to build into. Your parenting days may be over. Now, the truth is, you have kids, no matter how old you are and how old they are, you're always their, you know, their, their kid, I mean, they're, you're, you're the parent. But if you love Jesus in the Bible, that, that, to me, that's, that's what, for me, from a simplistic standpoint, from ministry standpoint, whether I'm here in a pastoral role or prayerfully I'll be accepted and, and uh, certified one day as a, as a chaplain, um, I, I want people to know Christ. And I want people to know the Word of God. Because as you know the Word of God, you, you enrich who you are and you have an impact on other people. And if you don't, honestly, if you don't know the Word of God, you don't have that relationship with Christ. You're kidding yourself. If you love Jesus in the Bible, find someone to build into one-on-one relational ship, the relationship. That's what Paul had with, with, with Timothy. D- number two, don't forget your call, mom and dad, or singularly depend on the church to raise up godly men and women. While God has ordained and birthed the organism called the church, he first, did he not? He first and, for, and foremost, he ordained and created the family, Right? That said, number three, another application thing, take advantage of the supplemental opportunities that are available to you. 
Sunday school in Awana and whatever kids clubs and, and, and youth group. And number four, time is ticking. You want to leave a legacy as a mom, as a dad. You want to leave a legacy. It's not too late, no matter how old your, your kid is. Okay, we will build into the next generation. That's what we see here in verses 1 through 5. In verses 6 through 10, we will, number two, we will be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. We'll boldly go where He leads. The Bible speaks to us in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, your exclusive understanding. In all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. That verse is worthy of being exposited and sat on every single word. And everybody here knows it, right? There will be times when your best intentions or wisdom may not be either, number one, the Lord's intentions or plan, or the Lord's plan of attack at this moment in time, or the Lord's call at all for your specific life or ministry. Here's verses 6 through 10. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so passing by, we can get all befuddled by, why? What's going on? Why? Why? Throw the whys away. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was, was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go out or go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Verses six through ten. Application, field view, life application. I, I go back to Proverbs three, five, and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your paths straight. If our aim is to have a ripple in and beyond the region of Kankakee, what, what would we do well to learn from the history recorded here? From Acts 16. Number three, we will bust, we will bust, bust through cultural and or caste systems. Verses 13, 14, and 30 through 33. The Church of Christ is birthed with the express purpose to go. The church was birthed with a, with a primary mission, a singular mission to go and make disciples of all types of people any and everywhere. We see that in Matthew 28 in Acts chapter 1. No litmus tests. No qualifying standards. No height or, or weight or degree minimums. No concern about race. Or social status. Go. Make disciples of all nations, all flavors, colors, people. If the Spirit of the living God has opened your eyes, revealing the cesspool of sin and chasm separating you from relationship to God, it is our honor, it, it, would, be, it would be my honor to implore you on behalf of God to be reconciled to him. And to tell you to run, run into his arms, because he loves you. 
And he died for you on a cross. Verses 13, two examples, busting through cultural and or caste systems. We see here in verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we, by the way, we, us, Luke, our author, is with him here, okay? We went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together, a collection of women And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Had they gone to those other areas that they were seeking to go to? Remember? They were told by the Spirit, no. They would probably have not had this occasion with Lydia who served as a huge backbone of support and encouragement of Paul's ministry. So, But it's a woman. It's a group of women. They see these women down by the river. They don't walk away thinking, well, you know, that's, that's just, those, are, those are just women. i got to tell you, I think I've shared through Connect and through uh, other ways that this piece that uh, Dallas Jenkins has put out called The Chosen, it's a DVD series, I'm telling you, if you don't have it, you need to get it. You can access it, I believe, through YouTube as well. The Chosen. You need to look at that. It is, it is so refreshing and so moving. His conversation with the woman at the well, the last of the episodes in this particular season, was, was powerful. Women. Women, to to Jesus, we're precious. And then verse 29, and following, and the jailer, this hardened, calloused skeptic, the, the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe capital B. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household, your ripple will have an impact on the rest of your family. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Women, Common laborers, minimum wagers, single parents, divorce couples, IRS agents, politicians, hard rockers, busting through cultural and caste systems. So here, here's the life application, the field view. We need to slay the preconceived, tainted, unfair, prejudiced assumptions or or feelings that that you and I, that we might have about limits for the gospel. Isaiah cried out in Isaiah 55, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. What's the key word there? Everyone. Everyone. May the tapestry of our ministry be speckled with all colors and types and flavors of men, women, and children who have fallen in love with Jesus. You're all aware that we become honorary Texans pretty soon. And the pursuit, the aim, the hope, the prayer is that I will be hopefully, prayerfully, eventually certified in two years as a, as a chaplain officially. You know what I'm looking forward to? 
I'm going to miss this. Do you know what I'm looking forward to? Meeting people of every stripe and color and background. Seeking to listen and, 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 and look for opportunities to make much of him in a tactful, graceful manner with patients and with nurses and with doctors and with surgeons. I've, I've never been a part of a ministry like that, that diverse. May the tapestry of our ministry continue to grow and become more and more diverse. I mean, if you look at Jesus' life inside the Gospels, he was awesome. He made women feel incredibly valuable. He, he, uh, he spent time with kids. Again, The Chosen has an episode centered around his interaction with children. It's awesome. Bust through cultural and or caste systems. Number four, be prepared. Finally, number four, last. Be prepared to defend the faith and fight for it with integrity. with integrity verse 35 but when it was day the magistrates sent the police saying let those men go here's the context remember context is so important when you're reading scripture know the context as much as you can context paul and silas paul and silas are arrested they are arrested for ruining the business interest of abusive owners who were using a slave girl's demonic, possessive state for gain. They were, they were arrested. And with no just cause, they were thrown in jail and then were released the next day in an attempted hasty and closeted way. Just let him go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, well, hey, the magistrates have sent to, to let you go. Uh, therefore, come on out and, and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. He says, no. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. And so they came, and they apologized to them. And they took them out, they took them out, and asked them to leave the city. <laughs> now, Paul's demand for a formal apology from the magistrates was primarily driven by public perception. It was essential that the young Christian community uh, have a good reputation among the authorities if its witness was to flourish. It's about integrity. Christians broke none of the Roman laws. Luke was at pains, the writer Luke was at pains to show this. It would continue to be a major emphasis inside the book of Acts. Integrity, being above reproach. I mean, honestly, friends, when you and I are talking to people and we happen to mention something about church or whatever, and uh, some people might make a comment, Ah, what a bunch of hypocrites. I never go to church. Have you heard that? Well, come on, you have. At some point. Why? Because of the lack of integrity. 
on the part of those that play the game by coming here for an hour every Sunday and think that they're good to go. That's why. In this instance, Paul and Silas were totally innocent of any wrongdoing. It was important, it was important that the magistrates acknowledge their innocent, innocence and set the record straight. This was why Paul made such a major point of it. If you will, it was a significant needed retraction. Isn't it funny in the newspapers when there's a retraction that's needed to be made? <laughs> Where is it? Honestly, it's on page eight and down at the bottom of this little tiny little paragraph where you got to get a microphone. To, yeah, mic, microphone. Mic, hey, you, you, you got to. Yeah, thank you. To see it. How we act. How we act. How we behave is so important. People are watching. We are living epistles, Scripture says, letters read by all men, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. P Peter shares in 2 Peter, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that, so that when they speak against you as evildoers. Friends, we're living this right now, are we not? Right wing, fundamentalist. So that when they speak evil against, against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. For this is the will of God, Peter goes on, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. That's all in Acts chapter 16. And here's the, the life execution, the, the, the application point here, field view. We're down in the field. If, if we know that our cause or our position on a given issue is rooted and tethered in the book, not just any book, the living book, we will hold, we will hold gracefully to it. Every single topic that we can think of may not be clearly black and white, but more often than not, there will be enough material or scripture to provide an opportunity for solid conviction and conversation. So, there are, there, as you go through chapter 16, again, these are sweeping chapters we're looking at, looking at them quickly. There are other themes that, are, that shoot through this chapter. Being a team, and the dynamic of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Uh, uh, the power of money, and how it corrupted these people to use a woman who was de demonically possessed. Spiritual warfare. I think what we've provided is enough to chew on and prayerfully be applied as a church family. We would do well to learn from the past as presented here and aim not to forget it, but aim to repeat it. May it be said of us, rooted in Acts chapter 16, verse 5, may it be said of us, so Calvary Bible Church was strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Amen? Make it so, dear Lord. Make it so. Sorry. I feel like I'm the first time here. Is this, are we done now? I saw an order of worship that had something else on it. Okay, we're done. Why don't you stand real quick? Thank you, for, thank you for being here and being attentive. Uh, pray that the Lord would strengthen you and use you 
wherever he places you for his purposes. Lord, I ask you that you would guide these friends, direct their steps. I pray that they would trust in you with all of their heart and lean not on their own intellect, their own strength, their own powers, their own creativity, but acknowledge you in all things. Trusting in you, knowing that you will make their paths straight. Use them somewhere, someplace with someone this week. I'd love to hear testimony of how that might have happened. Uh, thank you for Acts 16 and the continual journey of the church growing. Thank you for discipleship. We see that modeled. I pray that we would love people regardless of who they might be and what position they might hold as long as we hold fast to the Word of God, trust in you, and are humble, Lord, I pray that you'd use us in your name. Amen. Lord bless you guys. Thank you. Please put on your masks. If you haven't, that would be great. Thank you.